Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. I'm one of your regular hosts, and I'm joined today by another of our regular hosts, Prem. Hello, Neil. Thank you for the introduction. I play the role of head of tech on our uh, West Market, and I'm also one of the regular hosts on this podcast. Over to you. And we are talking today about a burgeoning topic about uh, strategy patterns for multi-cloud deployments. We have two of our colleagues here, uh, and I'll let them uh, introduce themselves. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Good evening to everyone. My name is Rashmi Tambe. I'm based in India. Um, I lead the service line called EMPC, uh, which focuses on enterprise modernization platforms and cloud. Very happy to be here. Thanks for hosting us. Over to you, Sunil. Yeah, thank you, Neil and Prem, for uh, hosting us here. Uh, I pair with Rashmi leading the enterprise modernization, digital platforms, and cloud service lines in India and service offerings that we offer to our customers. Uh, happy to talk more on multi-cloud along with everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so I'll get us kicked off, Neil, like you said. Okay, so the first question, right? Uh, multi-cloud is, is um, an oft-used term. So can you tell us what, what exactly multi-cloud actually means by defining it? Sure. So multi-cloud is used in many different, different uh, quotations you, you might hear. So multi-cloud refers to the practice of using multiple cloud service providers, both public and private, for your compute, storage, cloud-native services. Many enterprises choose multi-cloud for leveraging best-of-the-breed services, avoid want vendor lock-ins, and address business continuity and scalability of their applications. So in short, multi-clouds are when you are using multiple service providers and there are many flavors to multi-cloud. A lot of people call multi-cloud for hybrid cloud when they are using on-prem and one of the cloud service provider. They call and use it as a poly-cloud when they are using two different cloud service provider for different use cases. They are using it in a portable cloud mode also or the distributed cloud as well. Wonderful. Thank you. So you you mentioned some of the different deployment models there and, and some of the different names. Can you differentiate some of the uh, the different deployment models there between hybrid and poly and portable versus distributed? We talk about uh, multi-cloud. Sure. Uh, so uh, usually the journey to cloud starts with uh, mono-cloud or it's also sometimes also called as uni-cloud when an organization chooses a, p- a public cloud provider to start their cloud journey. Usually the journey starts with lift and shift or rehost of certain applications. Then comes hybrid cloud. Uh, many a times, uh, so we've seen this with banks mainly wherein the customer facing uh, applications are deployed on public cloud, but the backend systems, the legacy systems or the mainframes are still on on-premise or the, the data center. This is a classic hybrid cloud setup. It then starts becoming complex with a little bit of maturity uh, when an organization starts looking at more than one public cloud provider. And the choice usually is on uh, you know, using best of breed services from the cloud providers. Uh, you're making use, for example, we've seen certain patterns like using AWS and Azure for container workloads, but maybe explore GCP for data and machine learning workloads. And that's when you are making best of the breed services. Uh, you're making you're leveraging best of the breed services. That's when it becomes a poly cloud uh, deployment model. Uh, portable cloud, as the name suggests, it's a choice for an applic- uh, for an application to be deployed on either of the clouds or ma- or many clouds. Okay, so which makes it you know fundamentally the application architecture has to be cloud agnostic for an application to be run on any cloud provider whenever needed. Uh, usually these th- this happens in an active, active, active passive kind of a mode ac- across multiple clouds. And last but not the least, for larger organizations who have grown either 
organically or inorganically they have workloads running on diverse environments you have your on prem environments multiple cloud providers your edge workloads all of this getting managed centrally from one public cloud provider uh, is usually a distributed cloud setup uh, this usually applies with complex like, for example telecom companies you know large companies you know across geographies workloads that's when distributed cloud becomes very very prominent wonderful thank you is it inevitable once a company reaches a certain size that they're going to end up on multiple cloud providers? Because it seems like every large client we have at some point comes up with one of the several reasons you you posted for, you know, we need to be on multi-cloud. Yes, true. And there are many reasons that uh, we have seen in the industry that people adopt multi-cloud. And first and foremost is best of the breed. Based on the use case and the problem they want to solve, they decide to choose and go to certain cloud service providers. Sometimes based on the regulatory compliance requirement of the local government or local data laws, they need to choose different cloud service providers as well for the business continuity as well. There are reasons that companies don't want to get vendor lock-in and that's why they choose cloud agnostic architecture and deploy to another service provider for the compatibility test. So there are plenty of reasons. There are some geopolitical reasons as well, where certain cloud service providers are not available in certain country or region. And because of that, they have to go towards the other cloud service providers. So yes, true, multi-cloud for the large enterprises, which are global businesses, end up in multiple cloud service providers for sure. Uh, just to add to Sunit's point, uh, another reason is the in general inorganic growth of organizations when they keep on acquiring newer companies which are on different cloud providers, the multi-cloud becomes an, inev an inevitability because you, you, know, you have multiple companies in your portfolio on different cloud providers which would mean that you are now on a multi-cloud environment. Great. Multi-cloud challenge seems like a lot of work, right? And so, so what are some challenges that you that you see when organizations are looking to adopt a multi-cloud strategy rather than sticking to just one single cloud? Some of the uh, you know prominent challenges are uh, the cross-platform or cross-cloud infrastructure automation and having uniformity in it. For example. Uh, if you're using, let's say, AWS cloud formation with AWS, and uh, if you're using Google Deployment Manager with GCP, and now you have a simple policy, for example, a dev machine cannot exceed a certain size. Okay? If you're using these disparate uh, automation tools, you are going to write the same policy in two different uh, for two different cloud providers. And I'm giving a very, very simple example here. Usually in an enterprise setup, as all of us are aware, the, the compliance policies, the security policies, these they are very, very complex and you will end up doing it across cloud providers. So generally, we give an advice of using uh, something like Terraform, which, is, which brings a little bit of a uniformity when you are doing infrastructure automation. The other challenges is, uh, as we started the podcast, we said multi-cloud is a pretty cliche or often used word. And when people say multi-cloud, they're usually talking about application portability. If you think from the first principles angle, what sometimes we think that people are not thinking about, do they really need portability? What business problems are they solving by making an application portable and investing into a cloud agnostic architecture, which is, you know, which is time consuming? Why do you need portability? I think these are, you know, sometimes people should ask the questions, uh, do they need portability? And if yes, then what sort of architecture patterns are you going to apply to achieve that eventual portability? Well, that, that brings up an interesting question that I'm sure you get a lot uh, in this space is, well, I want to be agnostic across all cloud providers because it would be strategic for me as a company to be able to support any cloud provider I want to. What What's the, the fallacy at the heart of that strategy uh, from a company? So 
if you have decided to go uh, on cloud um, why not make most use of the underlying cloud platform if cloud is if cloud transformation is part of your growth and scale and revenue growth why not make most use of that and if you are saying that you need to be agnostic across cloud providers i think it again goes back to that original question make being cloud agnostic would mean that making use of services or self managing most of the services for example you would you would not use managed kubernetes you would manage your own kubernetes clusters you would not you make use of uh, managed databases you probably want to manage your own databases so all of these architecture decisions are costly time consuming and yes you can take those decisions but but we give certain guidelines that what type of workload should be chosen for a complete cloud agnostic uh, uh, architecture because then you are looking at for example you are looking at business continuity you are looking at very high sla for a consumer facing application where you are looking at active 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 passive across cloud providers then yes you should do cloud agnostic but in general a very blanket statement that hey we want to be cloud agnostic at a company level i think people should do a double click and what actually it means in terms of architecture efforts and timeline and budget as well i think that's how some of these um, questions you know should be tackled well i i think it's so my analogy for this i, I think you're exactly right is that so there were there are two models that the industry follow, followed. One was the the relational database, the SQL relational database, and the other was J2EE application servers. There is a standard for SQL, an ANSI standard, but it's so weak that it's useless without every vendor adding their own proprietary behaviors, and therefore you get locked into a particular database vendor forever, and they make a lot of money on those things. The counter to that was j 2 E, where there's tremendous pressure in the community that we want a j 2 E standard, and as soon as they ink that standard, the value of application servers plummeted to zero because open source came along and completely ate them. So uh, as much as we would love for cloud providers to provide some sort of generic API, they will never do that because they want your subscription money. They need the cash flow. And so they're going to actively make sure that you can't effectively create one thing that talks to every cloud provider because it's in their best interest, as you said, to provide unique services to entice you to use more and more of their cloud and less and less of their competitors because there's a huge arms race going on there. So I think it's a misnomer to think that there's ever going to be some standard cloud API that works across all clouds because it's very much not in their interest to do that. Yes, and that's very true. And that's why when we have to look at all different types of workloads that exist in our ecosystem, we need to classify them if they have a very business criticality and we are into the cloud specialized uh, architecture, then we are in a risk zone that we are dependent on the cloud service provider heavily. In case if our application, which is not very business critical, and if you are building it in a cloud agnostic way and not leveraging cloud, we are into very expensive zone where we are putting a lot of money to build agnostic, whereas the value is not that much. So our analogy is that just be careful about these two zones when you are choosing your application architecture which is leveraging cloud services. Wonderful. You know, look, uh, moving to one cloud or, or migrating to one cloud seems complex enough. And now you're talking migrating to multiple clouds. So this seems like you're saying you need to be really, really tall, metaphorically, to be able to pull this off, right? So what are some common failures, uh, mistakes that... Um, organizations make when they are trying to move to a, a multi-cloud strategy? Now the first thing that we talk about whenever we are adopting multiple cloud service provider, at an organization level, we should have a very clear business objective defined why we are going with this multi-cloud. We don't want to be just fancy or just for the sake of trying out something. So it's very important that what business value we are going to get what business problem we are trying to solve by going to the multi-cloud service 
services second that i would say is leverage the automation infrastructure as code while going to multiple cloud service providers continue to do that make your choices which are agnostic to cloud service provider like choosing tools like terraform for infra provisioning vault hashicorp vault for security purposes open policy agent for policy rollout and have those strategic thinking in place before you start your journey there so these are the common couple of mistakes that people make while just starting with the journey on multi cloud in ad hoc way let's talk of on a related note let's talk about trade offs right now uh, yeah you mentioned a bunch of mistakes that uh, uh, organizations can make what should uh, organizations be cognizant of you know in terms of uh, trade offs and choices when they are looking to adopt multi cloud so uh, first and foremost is um, when you are looking at multi cloud you should assess the cap- your team's capability to do multi cloud for example if you are thinking of let's say i'll go back to my earlier example uh, if you are thinking of doing machine learning in gcp because uh, originally gcp started as hey we can do data workloads really well okay so if you are following that fancy and say that okay i want to use gcp for my data workloads for building my data lake for doing machine learning modeling there i think fundamentally you should look at whether you have capability in your team when you made that choice do you have the capability to support that if you do not have the capability do you have plans for uplifting your teams to uh, to come to that level where you can do data lakes on gcp if not are you outsourcing are you hiring so that has to be thought about uh, the the second uh, you know uh, the the ch- when you make make these choices for example uh another choice that i'll talk about is uh, you know uh, which sunit talked earlier that you know your business critical application uh are you making a choice of making this available in a in a active active or active passive or or in a disaster recovery manner if you are you making a choice of doing this on multiple clouds can it be done on different azs you know in the same cloud provider if your active active can be on two different azs then why are you looking at a multi cloud based active active dr strategy for your organization i think some these are some of the hard questions just just because you have another cloud does not mean to set up a dr setup on another cloud you could do it in the same cloud on a different easy that's also possible so these are some of the questions that should be asked uh, when you make those choices otherwise the 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 another trade off or another thing that i can think of is Uh, the whole cost factor managing see nowadays cloud as a cost optimizer driver that that shine is lost cloud cloud is no longer a cost optimizer or cost saver for an organization you are going to spend money in cloud and if you are going to spend money in one cloud obviously when you are doing looking at two clouds then you are going to spend even more money in two clouds so if you do if you have not thought about a very good way of doing cost management then then that's also a big problem if you're making choices of these you know uh, across uh, cloud or choices of your application i want to add a couple of more trade offs that we have seen the first one is defining the clear guidelines for application or workload deployments right so if you have two cloud service provider as a choice we need to have a clear guidelines defined that which kind of workload we want to deploy in which cloud service provider and what are the benefits of that and now this guidelines once published it's very clear uh, path to production for every application or workload that they are building and trying to deploy second that i would like to talk about is the operating model so when you are doing uh, when you are working with single cloud you have your single cloud operating model defined very well working fine but when you are moving to multiple cloud service provider now are you going to have two choices of tools for doing the same thing across cloud service provider so we need to make sure that we have to make now choice and trade off like should we have two different tools or should we think of a unified way of 
solving that problem. Now, one classical problem that we have seen is the observability. When you have two cloud service provider, your applications are deployed across. Sometimes you want to correlate the observability data, but they are into different observability tools. Now, it's very, it's very tricky to correlate data manually or to say, look at two screens and all. So make a choice investment in unified tool or have one setup where data is published, right? So tools like Datadog, New Relic, many tools are there in the market which can give you this capability. Even observability data from on-prem can be pushed to these tools and you can have correlation across on-prem and multiple cloud service provider. So I would suggest two main things again, have unified operating model and have trade-offs and choices there. And second, have a clear workload deployment policy defined for your organization. Well, and I think what you're getting at there is intent. I, I see a lot of organizations just sort of letting their cloud strategy grow like a weed rather than, you know, building a garden out of it. And then you get into a big trouble. It's amazing how fast you get into big trouble with, uh, you know, ad hoc deployments and 16 different ways to do so, stuff. But I want to touch on something uh, that both of you mentioned in that answer, uh, which is, uh, first of all, cost. Uh, a lot of organizations still seem to think that it's cheaper to move the cloud, and it almost never is. Uh, it's strategic, uh, and there are reasons to do that, but cost savings is not one of them uh, uh, in, in almost any case. But you were mentioning observability. I want to raise that up one level and talk about the reason you use observability, which is governance. That now you're moving your operations to someone else. Now, how do you govern that if you don't own it anymore? So that seems like a big topic area in multi-cloud strategy. Yes, very true. And again, we see that similar analogy that we have applied in our cloud adoption and cloud journey for a single cloud. We have to amplify it for the multi-cloud. And that's the trick here whenever we are dealing with the multi-cloud. So we apply five lenses to our cloud governance. First is the cloud cost management. Now, if you are dealing with cloud, cost management is going to bite you heavily if you are dealing with multiple cloud. Second, how you are going to manage your access across different tools, different applications across cloud. So you have to get your identity and access management right and govern then govern that very well. We have to apply our compliance policies and securities uniformly across the cloud and we need to have a good governance there. That is your third lens of governance. Fourth lens is to have better resource provisioning and deployment. If we are doing different ways of provisioning resource across two cloud providers, we are going to end up in a chaos there again. And the fifth one is around data. Who has access to what kind of data, including observability logs, access is important here. So apply your governance across these five lenses with following three key principles. First, make your all the governance related information visible on dashboard and have metrics around that. Once you have visibility and dashboard built, it is easy to put automated governance with fitness functions, alerts on top of that. And third stage is to shift left this governance earlier in your software development life cycle. So you can monitor them early rather than very late in the game. So apply five lenses and three guiding principles to approach your governance. So sounds like uh, you're suggesting that there needs to be this this abstraction layer or an experience layer between the organization and these cloud providers. Did I get that wrong? Or, or are you suggesting something else? True. And that's what we have to build as a common frictionless experience for our development teams. So that when they want to deploy their application, they have one common tool or abstraction which can be leveraged to provision infrastructure or monitor their applications or govern their infrastructure. 
So just to add to that, uh, Prem, when you say a uh, common uh, infrastructure, I think um, uh, it can be easily see, seen as we are uh, throwing yet another tech to solve the problems created by tech. Okay, So two cloud providers coming together, creating problem, and then we are throwing more tech to solve that problem. Okay, That's job security, right? Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> Right. But then um, I think, you know, uh, and there are two schools of thinking here. And um, I think nowadays with multi-cloud, there's a lot of, uh, at least I'm hearing a lot of chatter around something called a super cloud or meta cloud, which is this abstraction there, which sits on top of these clouds and gives you a unified way of, you know, all the things that Sunit talked about. Okay, uh, One school of thought is the same that I said, okay, you're throwing tech to solve the problems that tech has created. But the other school of thought is also that if you do not do this, see, eventually you will still have to, for example, simple cost management. You are going to look at CloudWatch logs and you're also going to look at some you know, other cloud providers logs and you're going to compare, which means that you're going to spend manual hours to do that. So the best way to handle is to have that layer which does, you know, which provides you a single pane of glass to do both the things. So, you know, at the end of the day, yes, it's a tech to solve tech. So. So it sounds like we've been doing this enough now uh, that you've started building some uh, ideas of patterns and anti-patterns around the strategies. You've got some principles and some other things laid out. And, you know, a, a pattern's not a, a best practice. A pattern is a, in this specific scenario, this is a good solution to this problem. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the emerging patterns that you've seen in this space, you've already been touching on a lot of those, but also anytime there are patterns, there are also anti-patterns. So uh, do you see any of those commonly starting to pop up in a particular context? I see a couple of anti-patterns uh, when adapting multi-cloud. One is looking at multiple cloud service provider without having the application deployment metrics. People go with the business unit, one business unit using AWS, one business unit using GCP within the organization, rather than choosing one cloud service provider for one purpose, leveraging it with the maximum potential and having that consistency across the organization. Right. So this is one anti-pattern that I've seen. Second anti-pattern is proliferation of tooling. When they go with multiple cloud service provider, people start leveraging tools across whatever they like, whatever they have come across. And rather than step taking a step back, looking at what we are using, can we leverage the same tool for the other cloud service provider also or not? And then making a choice there. So as we talked about like having the operating model defined, for multi-cloud as well, rather than jumping the gun. Oh, when we are in GCP, let's use GCP way of deploying applications, right? And when we are in AWS, let's do AWS pipeline. Now that these are the uh, two anti patterns that I have seen mostly. Some of the patterns that um, uh, that are coming up is being able to uh, manage your, for example, if you have containerized workloads across diverse environments. How do you manage them uniformly? How do you, uh, you know, apply uh, policies uniformly? And there is, a, uh, you know, we're seeing, uh, for example, Google and Thos does, uh, you know, uh, talks a lot about being able to manage your workloads irrespective of whether, they, you know, whether they're running on-premise, whether they're running on other cloud providers, whether they're running on edge. So there is a, a increased uh, chatter around, how do you do? Um, how do you manage your container workloads across cloud providers using some of these tools? Like there's also Rancher, there is Kubler. Uh, I think IBM Satellite also claims to do uh, you know cross cloud management. So that's one uh, could be one emerging pattern. Uh, the other thing you know which we already touched upon uh, briefly the portability part. Uh, we've seen certain customers you know they they would come and approach us and say that, hey, why don't you talk, tell us how to do multi-cloud? And in the first discussion, uh, and these are like customers who are on-premise and they would tell you that, hey, uh, we, I want to do, I, I want to make my application portable between 
uh, AWS and Azure or Azure on GCP. And one of the things that we, you know, we tell them that, hey, you not even started your cloud journey. So thinking about application portability is probably a third, fourth, fifth step for you. You first need to start about, you know, how and why you are starting your cloud journey, what sort of problems you're solving. If you're looking at two cloud providers, how, why you are doing that, then comes application portability. So I think call it pattern or anti-pattern. I think uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, again, throwing tech to problems kind of a mentality, which does not really solve your business problem. But just because your contemporaries or some leader in the or disruptor in the industry is talking about multi-cloud, people just get fascinated and they're like, hey, I want to make my applications portable. So this is also one of the things, you know, we advise our clients that, hey, you know, let's take a step by step journey. Let's not directly jump there. So. Uh, when you have applications deployed across clouds and when these applications need to talk to each other, um, either, you know, the, the, for example, either in an on-demand fashion or sometimes in batch mode, there's a, there's a need for do data movement. So where your databases are talking to each other, your maybe Kafka messages, messaging architecture is talking to each other. And many a times these, these kind of app, uh, architectures become, they become overly complex. For example, uh, you know, I would like to take an example to explain this better. Uh, let's say you have a taxi aggregator company. You use that in Singapore. You go to US. The, the user goes to US. The user's data from the Singapore shard needs to be copied to, let's say, a shard on US. Many a times, uh, if you are not, not doing these kind of proper sharding uh, techniques at a database level, uh, you will see a lot of latency in data copying. You may not see your loyalty point when you move around or there is a lag in the notification. So eventually there will be a consistency, but there will be the latency. And at an architecture level, you will have to be flexible and you will have to uh, you know, define what are those matrices that I'm going to track very closely and what are those numbers. For example, if it's okay if you have a latency of a few minutes. If you're going to live with that kind of a, a number, then, you know, uh, your architecture can become a little bit less complex. Sometimes this over um, uh, uh, prioritization of, hey, I need to have everything in sync, etc. That can make your multi-cloud architecture extremely complex, especially when you have multiple applications uh, sharing data with each other. So another question uh these cloud providers are constantly changing and adding new capabilities. And I know they try to maintain backwards compatibility, but sometimes the fundamental shifts happen. And a common mistake I see a lot of architects make is they think that once they've got an architecture solved, it's like solving an equation. They can just drop the whiteboard marker and walk away. But software is a constantly changing and evolving thing. So how do you avoid, if using multi-cloud providers, the constant churn of, oh, the API for this cloud provider has changed and now this one's changed. So it's, it becomes a game of uh, whack-a-mole. Is there any way to try to avoid some of the impacts of uh, the, the rapid evolution of the cloud providers? In today's world, there are tools which can help solve many of these problems. Like we talked about Terraform, where the actual service provider driver takes care of most of this internal things of service interacting with the AWS or GCP. And we are dealing with the DSL part of it, which helps us to abstract out that API level coding and work on the DSL. Same way, if we take an example of policy, if you want to roll out a security or a compliance policy using tools like Open Policy Agent, which uses Rego as a language to define a policy. And now we have to go and apply this policy into AWS and GCP. And the underlying tool takes care of that interactions. So choosing some tools which takes abstracts out this information and doesn't let you directly interact on the API is one way to solve these problems of uh, ever evolving uh, upgradation of the cloud service providers. Any closing thoughts that you want to um, 
discuss anything that we might have missed asking that you really, really wanted to answer uh, before we um, call this a, a wrap? So uh, one of the you know key message or key takeaways that uh, we've been advising clients is, uh, and it this might sound a little uh, you know rude also in terms of you know do it only if you need it. Okay, uh, for example, if you do not need multi cloud policy, if you do not need that portability, if you do not need to add those complexities, and if your teams are doing just fine with one cloud provider, why not continue with that? Okay. Uh, if you are a smaller company, a smaller startup, you almost should never look at multi-cloud. There's no reason. Your focus should be go deep down with one cloud provider because your business or your revenue or your growth depends on how quick you are going to do product launches to the market. The time to market is important for you and not get trapped into, uh, you know, should I use this? Should I use both? That's not needed. Okay. So one of the key messages that we tell clients is do it only if you need it because it adds complexity, it adds cost. You are going to need capability. You are going to need cloud SMEs to handle issues that, uh, that are going to eventually occur. So this has to be a very thought through decision. So that's one of the key things that uh, I would like to talk about. And Sunit, you want to go with next? And yes, do it only if you need it. But eventually you are going to need it. So I would say that if you end up into that situation, then have a structured approach and take a step back, create your proper strategy of adopting multi-cloud. Start as a first step of evaluating your workloads. Don't rush. What kind of workloads you want to put in which cloud service provider? Why? What are the benefits? Understand all the problems there. Second, create unified operating model to manage multiple cloud service providers and have a automated governing structure for your cloud environments. So that's our advice to everyone. Have a structured approach when you take up multi-cloud. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us today and giving us uh, your insight that you've been gathering, uh, working with clients and their multi-cloud strategy. It's uh, uh, great to uh, to uh, hear it and uh, continue building more uh, context and patterns around this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.